From a defabricated solar power garden shed in Rockland County, New York, USA, this is Stand Up with Pete Dominic. On today's episode, the top 10 reasons you should probably not put that on Instagram. And now, the podcast host who has no worries for such things because he sends inappropriate things to personal friends only, Pete Dominic. Yes, that's right. You'll be lucky if you get one. Thank you, Pete Go. He may have gotten many, which is probably where he got that idea. Hello and welcome to today's episode of Stand Up. I'm here each and every day. I thank you very much for pressing play, for subscribing, for writing a review. Those of you that are paid subscribers, I can't do it without you. I've got an excellent guest joining me today, legendary comedian and comedy writer, multi-Emmy Award winning writer of Everyone Loves Raymond and the reboot of One Day at a Time. It's Mike Royce, for the first time on Stand Up. It's a real interesting conversation. I know you are going to love this one. And if you don't, I'll personally call you and have a conversation to replace the time that you lost. But I don't think that'll be needed because Royce is awesome and you're going to love our chat. First, I want to get to the news. If you went to bed and your bank was First Republic, well, then you woke up and now your bank is J.P. Morgan just getting bigger and bigger. Too big to fail? Oh, don't worry about it. Regulators took possession of First Republic Bank and then sold it immediately, all of its assets, marking the third major bank failure in the U.S. in less than two months. I have no idea what all of this means. I've got to catch up with people like Barry Ritholtz, Ron Insana, and others, because I know it's obviously a pretty uh, important issue. The Federal Reserve is on track to raise interest rates for the 10th time as part of its year-long effort to fight inflation. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen warned yesterday that the U.S. could default as early as June 1st unless Congress raises or suspends the debt ceiling. We found out the wife of Chief Justice John Roberts made $10.3 million dollars over eight years matching top lawyers with law firms, including some that had cases before the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court is not a court. Its justices are not judges. Uh, We've known that for a long time. It keeps getting murkier in the judicial branch. And a new poll has 74 percent of Americans blaming news media for political divisions in the U.S. I agree with that. I've been saying it for a long, long time. CNN announced yesterday that Donald Trump will be doing a town hall in New Hampshire next week with Caitlin Collins hosting. I, along with everybody else, savaged CNN for that. Yesterday was May Day and the world's workers rallied millions of people in the streets in France protesting the raising of the retirement age there. Crazy what's going on there. The Vatican apparently is on a secret peace mission in Ukraine. I'm sure that'll go well. I mean, I hope it does. More power to them. I mean, I think they have enough power. Uh, And finally, and personally, most importantly, Hollywood writers and studios are now in final talks as the midnight strike deadline looms. And by the time you're listening to this, it will have been decided. So you will know. And I will be directly affected by that because I work on HBO's last week tonight. It's a good chunk of money that I will be losing for as long as writers are on strike. I support them, but... Hopefully you can support me with a subscription here on the podcast because just lost a revenue source and that gives me tremendous anxiety. And you know what? I think this deserves a little bit more detail and nuance. So let's go over to NBC Nightly News where Lester Holt had their national correspondent, Miguel Algamor. Well, he pronounces his name correctly here, but the report I thought was pretty comprehensive. A couple minutes here explaining this very important story that's probably going to affect all you and me. The biggest drama in years is playing out in Hollywood. The industry bracing for a writer's strike just hours from now that could shut down your favorite shows. Miguel Almaguer explains what's at stake. Tonight's suspenseful Hollywood drama unfolding behind the scenes has come down to the wire, with just hours left for the Writers Guild of America to reach a deal with the Alliance of Motion Picture and Television Producers, which represents studios. 
At odds over streaming residuals, higher pay, and consolidated jobs, the men and women who write for your favorite television shows and movies are set to walk off the job at midnight. Nobody wants a strike, but they have to meet us. They have to meet meet. We're not asking for much. We're asking for just a livable wage and and for our jobs to be protected and for us to make residuals on uh, the, the, the content we're creating. If we don't stand up to these bullies, we're going to just keep getting bullied our whole lives and nothing's going to change. If pencils go down and picket signs go up, we could see a sequel to the 2007-2008 strike that lasted 100 days, cost an estimated $3 billion, and abruptly cut into show production. If a strike begins this week, the first thing that viewers at home will notice that their favorite late night shows will go into reruns. If there is a strike, the longer it goes, the more significant the impact, because nothing happens without a strip. A shutdown trickles down well beyond riders. Production props, even craft service teams would be locked out. That's tens of thousands of jobs. With negotiations still underway, the studio reps say its priority is the long-term health and stability of the industry. Tonight, the clock is ticking on this real-life Hollywood cliffhanger. And Miguel, joining me here in our Los Angeles studios, you've been talking to insiders. Are they surprised that the talks have gone on so late? Not surprised, Lester. These negotiations typically go into the 11th hour, but people that were optimistic are now pessimistic that a deal will be reached, and they worry that if there is a strike, it could last months. Oh, no, no, please don't last months, please. I cannot afford it. All right. Well, there's that. And now let's stick with NBC Nightly News, where Aaron Ross Sorkin explained what happened with First Republic Bank yesterday. And another concerning economic headline today, the latest bank failure, First Republic, now the third bank to fail in just two months, seized by federal regulators early today and sold to J.P. Morgan Chase. CNBC's Andrew Ross Sorkin joining me. Andrew, help us understand what happened here. This is the second largest bank failure since 2008. A hundred billion dollars of deposits left this bank over the past two months. It was a classic run on the bank. The government stepped in, saved that bank and effectively sold its assets to J.P. Morgan. The good news, depositors, all of them didn't lose any money at all. And the branches opened today. What it means even more broadly is that the U.S. government implicitly is prepared to guarantee all depositors at banks across the country. All right. There you go. Andrew Ross Sorkin and Lester Holt and NBC News. Thank you very much for that. And that includes today's newscast here on Stand Up with Pete Dominic. How was your May 1st? How was the kickoff of the week for you? I got to be honest with you. I was feeling very flat yesterday on a Monday. And I like that word. I want to use that word more. My friend David Campbell, who I speak to down in Australia every day, he uses that word from time to time when he's feeling a little down. It's like it's not depressed. It's not. It's kind of sad. It's kind of flat. It's uninspired. It's unmotivated. Just flat. Do you ever just feel flat? Well, I still got out and got a whole bunch done yesterday. Did a whole lot of work and then went to Julia's lacrosse game last night. Still feeling kind of gray and gloomy. The weather hasn't been helping, though it was sunny some yesterday. And so I went to this park before Julia's lacrosse game alone. And I, I'd never been in this park because she was playing an away game. And I hiked up this mountain and not mountain, but you know, steep hill. And when I got up there, I made like a video blog and I hiked down and the stream was roaring after like the eight inches of apocalyptic rain we've had over the past couple of days here in the Northeast. And I didn't feel flat anymore. Sometimes you just got to get out and switch your routine and get away from your normal surroundings that you're in each and every day. And that's what I did yesterday. So highly encouraged, get out on those flat days and try to do something really different just to shock the system a little bit, just to give you a little bit of a defibrillators on your day. You know what I mean? Clear. And then you just, you know what I'm saying. Anyway, it helped me. I hope that kind of helps you. And if not, then, well, I just wasted your time with uh, crappy advice. But just want to pay it forward. Okay, well, let's get to my guest, shall we? My next guest was raised in Syracuse, New York, just like me. He graduated 
10 years ahead of me, went on to college at Ithaca College, where my daughter will be going in the fall. From 1988 to 1999, he was a big deal stand-up comedian in New York City, where I first saw him perform. He did warm-up comedy, like I did at a whole bunch of TV shows. And then he got his first job as a writer on an MTV show. And then joined the writing staff of Everybody Loves Raymond, where he eventually worked his way up to the position of executive producer for the last two seasons. He executive produced Louis C.K.'s show. He was the showrunner for several other TV shows as well, which is a really big deal. In 2017, One Day at a Time was rebooted by Norman Lear, premiere on Netflix. Mike co-created the 2017 version with Gloria Calderon Kellett, who we talk about in this conversation. And Mike always has something cooking, some of which we talked about in today's talk, too. He's won Emmy Awards. He's done it all. And I'm really excited to have him joining me to talk about his life, his career, how he deals with frustration and ego, his thoughts on the writers, potential writer strike. We caught up uh, a couple days ago, and so we all know at this point what is happening with the Writers Guild of America. But I think Mike's opinion is very relevant. So I was really happy to catch up with one of my com- uh, comedy idols. He couldn't have been more kind, and I think we had a great conversation. I hope you like it. Mike is really active, by the way, on Twitter. So if you let him know that you heard him on the show, that would mean a lot. At Mike Royce. R-O-Y-C-E. Let's do it right now with the legend. Holy cow, there he is. The legend from Syracuse. The boys from Syracuse. Mike Royce, I am so grateful you agreed to talk to me. Thank you so much. It is a pleasure to be here. And yeah, I'm going back to Syracuse tomorrow for my father's birthday, actually. Oh, that's wonderful. That's wonderful. I mean, when I graduated high school, you had already become a pretty established comedian. I knew that you were a guy from Syracuse doing what I wanted to do. And it, I don't remember exactly the first time I met you. I think it was at the Comedy Cellar. Maybe it was in Syracuse. But I just remember how unbelievably kind and generous and thoughtful you were to this young boy with a whole bunch of hair. And I want to thank <laughs> you for that as well. You've always been, in the few times we've met and talked, always very kind to me. Well, it's all I have because I'm talentless. So, uh, no, it's also, um, I know you, everything you said was so nice. And yet what I heard was I was in high school when you were still way older than me. Anyway, um, I look, well, I looked it up. You graduated according to Wikipedia from Jamesville DeWitt, 1982. And I graduated from Marcellus 1993 for whatever it's worth. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, listen, are we, are either of us young? No. Um, am I older? Yes. Do we both look like baby seals? Sure. Yeah. I do. You know, I'm enjoying, I've, um, I have to take Ray Romano's compliment of having no hair, which is you've always looked old. You know, I mean, like, <laughs> it, Let me ask you though, about just, I, I said, you've always been nice to me. You know, I've always been kind to me. And I do have an actual, what I think is a good question you might like, um, you have kind of got this reputation as being a nice guy. Well, you don't kind of. So does Ray Romano, who you partnered with for years and were good friends with. So do a bunch of the other guys, Phil Rosenthal and others. The, the, you're a generation of comedians who worked in New York and at the Comedy Cellar that were nicer than the generation I came up in with Patrice O'Neill <laughs> and Jim Norton <laughs> and Nick DiPaolo. And that's, I, I mean, something I, my question to you is, were you guys while I'm sure you busted balls and manipulated and were jerks at times, weren't you a nicer generation before that, th- that happened? Cause some well, comedy I mean, changed. For, for, yeah. Jim and Nick were, I mean, they were certainly my generation as well, even though Jim is younger, Nick, you know, I mean, Nick was just, Nick's been Nick his whole life. <laughs> There's no, you know, and Patrice was just a particular personality that certainly could be abrasive, but was obviously hilarious. I think it's just different types of comics, you know, in other words, back then, I, I, I just, I'm a gentle soul and my, you know, I don't know. I, I, um, and there's other gentle souls out there, but there's, you know, vicious pricks everywhere. Always, you know, it's timeless. But the business that we're in that you certainly spent your career uh, being very successful in doesn't really cater or welcome gentle souls as much as it does vicious pricks. Or am I just being cynical? Seriously, you, you would know a lot more than I do. I mean, are, it just seems so cutthroat, obviously entertainment. It's a cliche. Is it? I don't think, I, I think there's, it, it's, 
If you're a vicious prick to other people and they don't want to work with you, that's one thing. If your persona is hilarious, it kind of doesn't matter. You're either going to make it or you're not. Right. You know what I mean? I think there's a there's a pretty small c- circle of people who are such incredible pricks that they just can't get anywhere. Um, and we don't have to name names. Uh, <laughs> but otherwise, it's like there's there's so much room for so many different kinds of humor, you know. Uh, for me, it's like, I, I mean, m- my career, I think, has been I was a very good comic, but I'm a better writer than I was a comic. And that's I'm not trying to put myself down for being a comic, but I think I truly blossomed when I became a writer. I, what I mean is the the people who are pricks who and who don't go anywhere is specifically <laughs> Patrice O'Neill, because Patrice <laughs> was probably the funniest guy. Maybe he was the funniest guy. Maybe he was up there. And if you knew him and you'd earned his respect, you know, there was a different relationship. But, man, there's guys like him. And I don't mind saying Nick DiPaolo because he's talked about it openly in his act who sabotaged themselves a lot. That's what I think you were saying. And I just named a couple because they they admitted that kind of thing. It, their own personality kind of held them back, even though they were you know, two of the funniest guys. Yeah, I think it's hard when you're. You know, Nick is, you know, his persona and I mean, he himself is so cynical. Yeah. Right. Cynical about everything. Right. And I think it's hard to determine where you start and your persona ends sometimes. And 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 also just where you're putting that in terms of how I mean, at the end of the day, somebody's trying to make money off of you, whether you're a comic or a writer. I mean, it's entertainment. So somebody's got to be funding. You know, they're giving you money so that they make money and finding a place for that. I mean, that's why Tough Crowd was so great for all those guys. That was the place, you know, that show was like, yeah, you can just be you. And that's what we want here, you know, and sometimes you just can't find places for yourself. And that that goes for whether you're a prick or whether you're a gentle yeah. soul. Sometimes there's a place for you and sometimes there's not. I feel like you'd moved to L.A. by the time and we're writing a lot by the time uh, that show started. And that's what I mean by this generation. Now, nah, there's obviously a lot of overlap. Uh, of like we, that started at the table at the comedy cellar guys just killing each other. And, you know, Colin took it and I feel like you had stepped up and out uh, of the day to day at that point. Cause you were, I think by that point you were working on Raymond. I think that's right. I think tough crowd was like early two thousands. Right. Yeah. So I think I had just moved to LA. I moved here in 99 and started working on Raymond, you know? Um, so yeah, the, the, the cellar also, I, I take great personal umbrage that I was at the cellar basically the 90s. That was when I was there. And when I started working there, uh, the co- comedy immediately went into a recession. And I was doing shows I would host a lot. And there would be five people in the crowd. I would have to start shows with no one in the crowd and just pretend there was a show. So if somebody stuck their head in, you know, SD would trick them into coming in. And then they'd be like, wait a minute, we're the only one here. Yes, you're here. You know, and then there would be hostages, basically. And we'd build a, a 10, 15 person crowd over the course of five hours on a Tuesday. Wow. That took place. That was like the first half of the nineties for me. Then, you know, things got a little bit over the second half of the nineties in terms of business, but I swear to God, the moment I moved to LA, the next thing I hear is like, Oh, the set was doing eight shows on a Tuesday and it's the most popular place in town. Yeah. I'm like, Oh, it was me. It was me. Obviously I was yeah. holding them back. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, you're not that kind of, you're, you're not that kind of fatalist. Are you for real? Do you have any, anything like that? Any kind of feelings like that? No, I mean, I'm making fun of myself yes. and it was uh, interesting. Uh, confluence of events though yeah that's when i uh, that, that's when i i around the time when i got past the cellar that was the the place and it was like that that many shows every night packed on a monday and a tuesday and in, in the small room so you'd always have a good set just the the best and so much has evolved and changed you i kind of like not purposely but i think maybe somewhat purposely or subconsciously i thought well if mike royce came from syracuse granted he's a jd guy you know they're a little bit more affluent than we are <laughs> if he came from central new york and had a career maybe i could have a career and and like you i became like the 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 host and the house mc at different clubs and new talent shows and like you i did audience warm-up com- comedy but unlike you i never got into writing because it just wasn't my thing where did your kind of path how did your path go because you grew up in Syracuse. You knew you wanted, you loved comedy. You knew you wanted to be a comedian at what point? And you became one in New York. You became a stud New York city comedian for sure. Yeah, it was a dream come true, honestly. And I went to film school. Uh, I kind of emphasize, you know, screenwriter. I thought I was going for writing to begin with. And then when I moved to New York, I started trying to get production work, 
that's a lot of work to just, you know, tri- be, cold calling everybody to try and be a PA in a commercial, whatever. Yeah. Started to like make a little progress, but then I sort of realized I'm going down the crew path and I want to be more in the writing path. And then I realized I'm in New York City and I've always wanted to be a stand-up comic. And if I go on at tips, <laughs> you know, and bomb, I'm going to come home. And guess what? No one knows the difference. No one fucking right. knows me here at all. Right. And so the anonymity of New York City gave me the bravery to go on because it was like, it's not going to matter. I was deathly afraid to do stand up in college because then you're trapped with your audience for the rest of your, you know, your life there. You bomb and then, uh, you know, you're walking around campus for two, three years. But, yeah, you remember you when you bombed, you know? Well, that's so, like, that's like uh, the, the worse than that would be a cruise ship, right? I've never done like one, a, but exactly. It's like a cruise ship those for men. years. I, I got to right. just ask you real quick. I, I got to take a per, point of personal privilege. Uh, part of why I wanted to talk to you. I'm not going to lie. My daughter is going off to Ithaca College as a freshman next year. And you spent four years of your life there. She wants to be in film and television and media. And so I thought, I know it was a bit ago, but how was your experience at Ithaca College? Because she'll hear this. Well, first of all, it's, I loved it. Absolutely loved it. And it was a great experience. And I credit a lot of, you know, they, they, it, it was a very good place to open up my mind creatively. I was a very little sheltered suburban white boy going in. And yep. there were professors there who, uh, <laughs> exposed us to films and concepts and just stuff that I had no idea about. And I definitely emerged with just a much better creative sense of myself. And since then also it was, it was the facilities have just expanded. So incredibly, you know, it's sort of like what happened with the seller. The moment I left college, they built a whole new communications building. So once again, it was me, everyone was waiting for me to leave. Um, (laughs) It's really, yeah, it's a fantastic college. And, um, yeah, she should have a great time there. The one thing I always feel that way about is, as my daughter's uh, now playing lacrosse, as my other daughter is a freshman. When we were growing up, we didn't have these amazing turf fields. Yeah, the, yeah. Their whole generation gets to play on these like pro fields, and we played in Central New York on like snowscapes with Rocks. manholes in them and gravel, and you know, <laughs> horrible. <laughs> So you yeah. moved from Ithaca, you graduated and moved to New York City? That's right. I had a roommate from Ithaca who had a room open up in Staten Island. Uh, so I moved to Staten Island. And, uh, um, you know, when you bomb and, and then you have to take the ferry ride home, it's like a special sense of shame. <laughs> oh, so that is very long. Very yeah. long. Yeah. My f- the first couple of times I did OK, actually. The third time I went on, I was at the improv and I got a low lottery number, like something I would have killed for when I was actually ready for it. But I wasn't ready at that point. Mm. And I went on and like all these amazing comics were there. Bill Sheft was on the lineup, who was Letterman's head writer for many years. Mike uh, Rowe, these like incredible guys, you know, at the top of the scene in the middle of the middle of the 80s. And then me and I did my five minutes and, you know, I didn't get heckled, but I certainly didn't get any laughs either. And then I had to get on the subway and then wait for the ferry. And then the ferry is like two hours of just feeling like two simple, two very simple methods of suicide right there. I remember <laughs> I remember waiting for the C train after bombing at Hamburger Harry's and thinking and I remember my roommate, my friend was with me. He went and watched me bomb. So there was a there was a witness. And I remember seeing the subway come and I, and I just I'm never really suicidal. But I remember just thinking, God, it would be so easy. <laughs> this is, because it's so painful. It was so painful. You could jump off the ferry, jump in front. But there's so many years and shows of, of real brutal emotional pain when you fail. Yes. I think that's, I guess, why I knew I really wanted to do it. Because I swore to myself, right. I, this is not for me. I can't feel like this ever again. And then a few months later, I did, did take a few months. But a few months later, I was like, yeah, I'll try it again. <laughs> so you did it again, kept doing it. You had like, you've done it all. I mean, your career is just because I, I am always most impressed with comedians who go on to anything, writing, acting or any other thing and, and later in their career, but who spent veterans. They spent the years they put in the pace. They did comedy at every single place in the tri-state area, probably across the country at clubs and colleges. You did audience warm up. You, you, you did all kind everything you can do as a comedian. You did it. And then you were able to evolve into a writer. But tell me about how important 
the comedy part, the stand up, the New York years, the part where you made your living as a comedian. How how, how important what is that to you now after all of your success and Emmys and awards and, and success as a writer? Um, for me, absolutely essential that I was a comic. There are comedy writers, plenty of them that don't need the experience of being a comic. But for me, I actually wrote a sitcom with a couple friends of mine right out of college. And I'm not kidding you when I tell you, if you read that sitcom, you would be like, okay, so listen, it's great. You tried. And you know what? It's not for everybody. It's not for everybody. Like, it's fine. You can just, you know, and uh, it's really not, it's not like, oh, there's a little potential here or whatever. It's like this, he doesn't have any idea what he's doing. You know, he doesn't. And I, I needed to get on stage and say words coming out of my mouth so that I internalized words coming out of people's mouths, <laughs> you know, comedy rhythm. It's, it's easy to like write it down on a page and think it's funny. And then when you actually say it, go, this is a, no, this is, it's all wrong, you know? So I threw so much repetition, especially in New York when you can go on every night. And I was on every night pretty much for 10 years, um, 10, 12 years every night uh, somewhere, uh, sometimes for hours and hours if I was hosting you know, you just develop this comedy rhythm and sense. And obviously you're exposed to all these am amazing, great comedians. Uh, so for me, it, I was able to emerge with writing skills that I never would have had if I wasn't a comic first. You know, I just got to say this, I guess is maybe a unique thing. It's not too many people you get to say this to, but God, I was just always rooting for you and always have been and watching you knowing that you had done comedy, what I wanted to do and then see you, get on Ray and move out to LA and, and, and right on that show. I was always just like so excited to see your success. I suppose to me, it meant maybe I can do it too. I certainly haven't had anywhere similar or near the career you've had, but I just was always so excited to see you succeed. And it seems like at this point, and I want to talk more about everything you've done. You must be pretty, uh, pretty happy uh, with what you've accomplished in your career. I am super fortunate and I've weirdly enough through the magic of cancellation because mm. I've had shows that I was sure. deeply in love with that I co-created or ran or whatever that didn't get to go as long as I wanted them to. I've the weird benefit of that is you get to work on more things. So I haven't just had one great experience. I've had many great experiences on, you know, a few different shows and I've gotten to spread, you know, stretch my uh, muscles and work on different kinds of things, not just comedies even. Uh, so, yes, I am. I'm very happy. <laughs> I, I have no reason not to be happy about yeah. my I career. And um, I, uh, I mean, I just I, I say that it's just good to hear people say that, especially comedians, especially people in, in comedy. You and I both know a lot of people that can never feel that that it's never enough, you know, no matter what they're doing, no matter True. how successful. It's like they'll never be happy until blank happens and blank happens and they're like still not. No, this isn't True. it either. Yes. Yes. Uh, tell me just uh, a little bit about the New York years. You, you obviously you hooked up with Ray Romano in New York City at those comedy clubs. He saw you perform. He asked you to open for him. He asked you to punch up some stuff and it progressed from there. Tell me about, you know, a little bit about that or any other comedians that you rolled with during those years and how that developed. Yeah, that was it. I mean, Ray actually got me into the cellar. We worked together at Catch a Rising Star in Princeton, you know, randomly and just hit it off and. He, you know, took me into the cellar and I kind of had no business getting in the cellar at that point. I probably didn't even have a half an hour. But anyway, uh, he had worked out and uh, he we just became friends. I mean, what's interesting is we were never I mean, we were friends in that we hung out a little more than, I guess, just comedians you see at clubs. But we weren't like together every day. I mean, I made friends with so many different comedians back then. And part of the benefit was hosting was, I mean, five hours at the comedy yep, cellar. It's like every too. single comic yeah. comes in and you're just talking to them. You're learning their act. It's like, I felt like an encyclopedia of all the, you know, comedians from the nineties, Ray and I would even get on stage and do his act. We in stereo, I would, I knew his act so well that I would, we would just do it side by side and we'd do a bit of his together. Cause he was just an old bit that he was really sick of doing. Um, so just like, you know, some late night shenanigans. Oh, that's hilarious. That. It was so much fun. And then, yeah, then he went and got famous and uh, I thought, OK, well, good for him. You know, I, I became a big fan of the show, which was odd because, you know, of course, I'm rooting for the show 
because my friend is on it. And then I watch it and I was like, am I crazy or is this actually really good? Like, do I just, am I just biased because I want him to, but no, like the pilot of everybody was was really good. Their batting ever after that was like super good. And I was like, God, he's on a great sitcom. He's not just on a sitcom. He's on a great sitcom. And then it's a hit sitcom, which how rare is that? You know? And then he is, as you say, kind. And he had me, uh, me and a bunch of other people, uh, op- start opening for him when he was on, you know, touring and stuff. And yeah, he's writing a book and he had me look at some pages of the book. And then he liked what I kind of my contributions there that became us sort of writing the book together. Um, I also wrote a sketch when he did Saturday Night Live that did really well. And I think that sort of helped things. And then a job opened up on the show and, you know, I'm the sports out. center sketch, right? Correct. Sweet Sassy Molassi. I can proudly say that I wrote Sweet Sassy Molassi. That is so Molassi. cool that you have that as a credit as well. That's so wonderful. Uh, so when did you get brought in the show? Uh, it was summer of 99. So the, 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 basically I started fourth season of Raymond and I stayed on through the uh, end, which was nine seasons. So, so I did six seasons altogether. Does that, can, I mean, you don't have to answer this, but at that time on that show uh, and that show then being in syndication, does that give you enough money to, for the rest of your life? You never have to work again. Like few people could say that, but I wonder if, you know, obviously Ray and Seinfeld, we know all those people, but like, I don't know what the writer's deals are. I would say back then, if you were, if I was to just retire, you'd probably move out of Los Angeles. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I'd have a, 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 yeah, I don't know that I'd feel super like, oh my God, I'm like rich, but I probably would have enough. I mean, those jobs on a hit network show and you're doing 24 episodes a year, you get paid per episode. Once it's a hit back then, again, they would just throw money or they don't care. They just wanted to keep being a hit. The amount of money they paid the writers was far better than what they're paying now, which of course is part of the reason there might be a strike. Um, but it was the amount of, even that um, uh, amount of money that they paid the writers was dwarfed by how much money the show was making them, you know? But don't you, st- do, as a writer, don't you still get royalties when that show continues to air, like the rest of your life, if it continues to air? I mean, will Yes, yeah, so you get residuals, but they start out, big and then right. they go down right. to like a floor so what when an episode of everybody everybody loves raymond uh re-airs on cable if my name is if i wrote you only get the residual if your name is on it like you wrote it so i wrote solo i don't know i think eight episodes six eight episodes wow and then i co-wrote a few more so I, my name is on like 14 or 16 episodes you know then you split the residual of course but so a solo episode of Everybody Was Raymond that I wrote that re like now when it re airs, I think I make five hundred bucks, you know. And well, then if it re airs a few few times in a year, then you know a few thousand dollars per episode, and then you got a few episodes, and then you know. But it, it's not it's not a gold mine now. It, it adds up to a lot of money. Yeah, yeah. Well, years. it's I, it's helpful the way that you explain that because if people don't know how television works writing works royalties residuals uh it's important to kind of help understand how much has changed because again that show and a handful of other shows in the 90s especially on networks cbs nbc abc we all know those shows we grew up with them those shows came and they will never return in terms of that kind of of money, right. just the way it is. I mean, um, you know, but those shows were so successful. There was not streaming, obviously. So maybe you can take it a little from there with about, because I kind of want to ask you, like, in your career, you have seen so much change in the, let's say, television industry, right? Yeah. Yes, I have presided over <laughs> generational change, which makes me feel very old. But Everything has changed. And, you know, the last time, by the way, I want to uh, amend what I said a little bit because that residual, I think it's even less now because in our last negotiation, the Writers Guild neg- negotiated down broadcast residuals in order to get a slight bump in streaming residuals because those are clearly the future. But streaming residuals are super duper bad, although they pay you per year, not per episode because, you know, it's on 24 seven. So and they don't where everybody's in an enormous fight with the streamers to release their information, but right now they don't. So you have no idea how many people are watching the show. So the economic model is not based on 
views. It's just based on you get, you know, a couple thousand dollars for a year's worth of views. It's of impossible use. to negotiate uh, a thing when you don't know what the thing is. Yes, they, it, it would be a they want all the leverage. I mean, they have all the leverage and they, you know, you, if you're a star of a show, it's you can't go. Oh, you, you know, yes, they, they, they the, the less information they give you, the better. Right. You know, it is for them. Uh, explain to me the right. diff. what a showrunner, what that job is. Uh, so showrunner is first and foremost head writer in charge of all the writing. That's like, that's why a writer almost always is the quote unquote showrunner, but also everything goes through you. You're the coordinator, visionary leader of that show. And, um, you know, you're signing off on the budget, the costumes, the sets, the locations that, you know, every piece of what happens on the show, uh, is signed off on by you. Obviously you're doing a lot of delegating in that position and it's, but it's, it's a very, um, you know, as a writer, you get used to doing one thing, hopefully really well. And your persona, uh, you know, a lot of writer personalities are not necessarily gregarious and certainly a lot of writers are not good at business. <laughs> right. So you're really developing muscles that may or may not be there. So some writers are amazing administrators, amazing business people. But uh, uh, for me, it's, it was, uh, you know, you learn, I learn more and more every show and I've been fortunate enough to do a bunch of shows, but you really have to take on, you know, a lot of times it takes all your tasks, take you so far away from the writing that you have to really make time for the writing because that's still your primary task and what you're in charge of. And you've done that job on, on a bunch of shows. You've been the head writer. You've written uh, so many different episodes of so many different types of shows. And one thing I want to ask you is working on a show like uh, one day at a time working on the Carmichael show. I'm just going through your, you know, your resume here. Uh, you a white boy from Syracuse have written on like black and Latino shows. <laughs> Um, so, if, you know, I, I, th I don't think that I, I kind of know what your answer will say. You don't have to be of a certain ethnicity to to write for characters who are not yours. Um, but you should have those people on the staff. But I mean, in your case, black people came and hired you, the, the, the producers <laughs> and, and stars of the show, uh, Latino people, Norman Lear, um, who's not, you know, who's an older white guy. But I mean, talk to me about why why diversity matters. But you can also, you know, be if you're a really good writer, it doesn't mean you can't write for someone that you're not. Uh, I agree with that wholeheartedly. Um, I would say there's a gigantic sort of caveat that comes with it, which is guys who look like you and me have always been able to write and allowed to write kind of everybody. You know, black shows have had white writers. Latino shows have had white writers. Every show has had millions of white writers. This, the, the industry, it's changing, but it's historically been his, enormously white. He Hall was written entirely by uh, Latino people, though, is surprising. <laughs> he Hall. Yes. A yeah. He Hall joke? He Hall is a, uh, <laughs> yeah, Spanish expression that means. Don't go down south. No, uh, not um, worth interrupting your important point with my joke. Sorry. That's okay. I was just so, like I said, we have been historically allowed to sort of write pretty much anything. Whereas if you're black or Latino or Asian or underrepresented in some way, generally speaking, historically, if you are allowed on a staff, it's because, oh, this is your thing. Like it's an Asian show. So you write that. But you haven't necessarily been uh, uh, given as many opportunities to write on white shows or, you know, on, on, on I, I don't mean, mean to say white shows, but like any other show you're thought of when it's like, oh, that's your thing. So you write that. But you're kind of limited to that. Again, things are changing uh, definitely over the last five, white people years. could forever but, write for an all black cast or mostly like the Jeffersons uh, or some show like that. But black people, Asian people, uh, Hispanic people would never be invited to white. Your, your right. opportunities would come only on the rare occasion that your people <laughs> had a show. Well, it, what's funny about or interesting about that is whether it's drama or comedy, if you're a black person 
you're going to have some really hilarious and unique insights into a white family. Like you're going to be a good writer on that show because you see it in a, in a different way. Like I would imagine someone that's not from the background, you know, or doesn't share the ethnicity of the main characters or even family probably has a pretty an advantage in some ways. Yeah. Well, and, and, and just the idea that like, you know, Oh, it's, it, 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 you're, that you don't want to limit people by their culture, you know, a black person, a Latino writer, they want to write like an action series, you know, that's that's not talking about race or uh, and, you know, writers want to write everything. And so the main thing is to give credence to what you were saying. Everybody needs to have the opportunity to write everything. You know, that that is the way it should be. I've been kind of, I guess, sticking to culture or ethnicity. What, how much is like the gender dynamics changed since you started more women in the writers rooms and on staff now than there was before? I feel like there was always, you know, at least some women, but it definitely was a they were a minority on most writing staffs, I'm pretty sure. Yes. And it's actually kind of insane to think how much that has changed yeah. because you kind of think, well, how different could it have been? But when even back when I came in 1999, there were not that many women in staffs. Raymond itself had mostly men, but there were there were there were women. There were women, uh, but it was still you, women had to fight a lot harder. Now I think it's a little bit. If you have a show that's all men, I mean, I don't even know if those shows <laughs> exist. You know, the the gender um, women are a much more accepted. Uh, it's it's what I'm trying to say. It's almost crazy to think of about a show that yeah. like, would be somehow like biased against women. Um, and there's listen, there's just progress needs to be continued to be made in all avenues. So you're that's, for that's, yeah. you're for women writers. You're saying, Mike, I'm going to go out on a limb and say I'm pro women being writers. Yes. <laughs> um. You, I, I love how much you do weigh in on culture and politics and social media and, and elsewhere. You're, you're never afraid. You're, you're never shy about that. And I think you make a, a lot of really great points on Twitter and elsewhere. Um, it's something obviously you care a lot about. W why? Like, what have, have you always been into politics, current events, culture? I guess I've always been interested in politics, but just in general, my experience as I go forward. I mean, I have been given bigger and bigger opportunities. I started as a writer and I became a showrunner. Then suddenly, you know, I'm on deals and like, I, I, you know, I have more opportunities to hire people. And then I sort of start to see the way those things work. And one day at a time was, was a big awakening for me in addition to everything else, because the reason, you know, Norman and his producing partner, Brent Miller, and I, they came to me first to reboot One Day at a Time. And they said, we wanted to reboot it with, with a Latino family. Let me just read this. And Follows three generations of the same Cuban-American family living in the same house. A newly divorced former military mother, her teenage daughter her, and tween son and her old school mother. That's just a quick summary on uh, yeah. MDB. One Day but at a Time. Yeah. When they met with me, they were just the idea was let's reboot it and let's do it with a Latino family not even specifying, um, you know, Cuban or Mexican or whatever. Um, and it was the three of us talking. And I was, of course, wanted to work with Norman Lear, but I was like, it's not just going to be us three. Right. Cause I, <laughs> we're not Latino. So I'm, I'm not, I don't know what I'm bringing to the table. That's going to really make that authentic. And they, they laughed and said, of course we're reading. So they, you know, they wanted to pair me. They came to me cause I had sitcom experience and they also were reading Latino writers and they wanted to pair us up together. So, they found Gloria Calderon Kellett and we paired up together and we made a, you know, immediately hit it off and creatively just super vibed. And we still talk pretty much every day and are hoping to work on something else together. But the point is I then really drafted behind her. It was, you know, the lens of the show was through her. I added creative elements. I had teenage kids because, you know, and then I was able to bring some of their personalities into those kids and I'm a comedy writer, so I can write and I'm a good storyteller. But, um, you know, it, it, it was interesting to see as we're staffing this show about um, a Latino family uh, and specifically Cuban, how you still get submitted so many, I mean, like almost completely white writers, you know, and you have to dig and 
it's like that it's inertia that becomes a truth in, in, into itself. It's like, there's no experience Latino writers because they never get the opportunity right. to write. And so we had to like beat, beat our agents into submission. Like stop sending me, you got to send me somebody because we can't make this show with an all white writing staff. It has to be mostly Latino. It has to be certainly enough where we're getting the authentic experiences of uh, this family told through the eyes of people who actually have lived this experience. Um, so that just seeing almost like how difficult that was did open my eyes to like whatever, I guess, diversity initiatives I thought were happening at the time. It's like, well, it's not happening enough because <laughs> this shouldn't be this big a fight. This shouldn't be this big a struggle to like get this staff together. You know, 46 episodes. It's a pretty big deal. It. Thank you for saying that, because we both got cut short. I mean, we were canceled on Netflix yeah. after three seasons. Then we were saved. Then the pandemic came along and the fourth season yeah. got interrupted. And we would have probably ended up with a good hundred episodes or so if we had been able, able to if there had been no pandem pandemic. But in this day and age, 46 episodes is still a lot of. Yeah. Episodes. I mean, it's a huge deal in this day and age. Uh, that's why yeah. I said it like that. I mean, there, that does not happen for most people involved on most shows. Probably I'm going to go out and say their entire career uh, television, episodic television. You know, think just imagine how many seasons there are of of any shows that you like. And uh, often there there aren't that many. And so bringing bring me to I mean, I, I'm trying to understand the 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 issue with the writer strike. I, I do uh, warm up on last week tonight. And I worked on Colbert and The Daily Show. And so I remember those strikes then. And now seeing this one coming, uh, certainly late night TV is going to have to take a break. I think it's I mean, I can't imagine they'll stay on uh, without writers uh, just for the political right. uh, uh, right. politics of it all. But obviously what you've been doing your whole career, most of your career, sitcoms and, and dramas, everything like how big of a deal is this and how likely do you think this strike is to happen, Mike? Well, it's certainly a very big deal because ever since we won control of the Internet, which is amazing to think about, we just had to argue that actually, you know, the TV is going to be on the Internet. And then the company's like, yeah, that's so far in the future. Why are you even worried about that? What are you crazy? You know, and then the, the moment the strike was over back in 2008, Hulu premiered the next day. It was it was just all huh. an obvious corporate nonsense, you know, argument on their part. So. Since then, 15 years later, even though we got the basics of a deal about the Internet in place, the economics have obviously completely changed. Everything is streaming and our contract has not caught up in any way. And when I say I mean, it's been left. People are just getting left behind. And like many industries, TV writing is turning into this gig thing. And so forget you're, you used to be your TV writer, like, like you're saying, you know, can you work, work on a hit show for a few years and then retire? Maybe forget that. Now it's gone from, can you do, retire after a few years on a hit show to, can you make a living to, you can't even make a living? Yeah. There are many, many people who get a job for like an eight episode or these mini rooms, you know, and they're working a few weeks and it's very hard to get a job, period always very hard to get a job. So if you're getting one job and it's just a few weeks and, you know, and that's it for your, you know, even though you're trying your best to get on another show, that's your whole year. You're not, you're not. And then the residuals, there's no residuals anymore uh, to speak of. People are very talented. People are having not uh, to basically move, you know, move back home. They have to give up. And uh, the next generation of writers is not only not being allowed to emerge, but, you know, not not even getting started, really. It's just changed so rapidly in just the last few years because of streaming. And I mean, you could look at it one way and say, and I think this is accurate. There are so many more jobs than there were with just, you know, a handful of networks. But as a result, uh, there's way less money. Is the, Am I simplifying it too much? I it, 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 no. <laughs> yes and no. There's obviously there are more jobs, but those jobs have started to become such diminishing returns. Yeah, right. right. That, that, yeah. And it just as a um, like in general, they've used streaming to just push, keep pushing every every uh, writer fee down, 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 down. So uh, you have showrunners even who are held on shows for so long because they're the only ones left. Like basically your staff is gone. 
because they only keep them for a few weeks. Then you're working on post-production and everything else. And things these days, not only the, the writer's rooms are shorter, but the productions can be longer. And so you, you're, because sometimes they take a long, you write everything first and then it takes forever to get into production. Right. And, um, so the showrunner, the, the, the amount of weeks that the showrunner might be working means that that big fat fee you're getting to be the showrunner is spread out over millions more weeks. And now suddenly you're working for the minimum. Oh God. As well. As oh God. Wow. You know? Wow. So, uh, yeah. is it, is it again, I'm, I, I should know more, but is it like, do, is the theory that the handful of executives in the network are just hoarding cash? Uh, or do they say, no, nah, we, we invest this back into more programming, more shows, more jobs. I mean, what do the writers think about what the networks are making and what they hopefully can get if they go on strike? It's pretty obvious that they have both made shit tons of money and plan to make shit tons of money. <laughs> What's happening right now is they're in a little bit of a, you know, uh, it's like everything is about following, uh, uh, chasing that quarterly report and then the, and the shareholders, you know? So right now, yes, Netflix's stock was like up here, you know, last year and now it's down here because they're, they're, uh, you know, they're reassessing how they do things, but they continue to spend the money. Uh, if you look at the figures on the product, you know, and so what they paid the writers in comparison with what they're still spending on the product that is still clearly intended to and will make them shit tons of money. That money to writers has, has continued to go down year after year. And listen, it's obvious to anyone who follows the news, corporate CEO and, and C-suite uh, salaries are out of fucking control. That's all there is to it. You know, there are people at the top of every corporation, not just media corporations, yeah. every corporation that are draining money from these companies. I mean, and, uh, it's, it, it, sometimes yeah. it almost seems like too uh, cynical to say that. But I mean, I worked at Sirius XM for 15 years. And I know exactly what the salaries and bonuses were and the ratio between what they were making. And I was on air talent. So forget about my producers and, you know, the young people worked on the social media team like people could barely pay their rent. And yet several of these executives we're making so much money in salary. And then, of course, on their bonuses as a result of the stock price. It, 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 so if you did want to do the math, everybody could be doing way better. And those executives could still have almost anything they wanted in life. That's how, how I saw it then. And that's just one company. I mean, I agree that, uh, you know, I want to rephrase what I said. I just think it's way too uneven. Someone who's a CEO is doing, you know, that's a hard job. I'm not trying to say like, oh, they just waltz in. And Nobody's saying that. It's just not right. It's not a 500 times more important it's than the writer. completely out of whack and it's, you know, gradually gotten that way and it needs to be corrected. That's just all yeah. there is to it. Yeah. It's uneven. It's way too uneven. And yeah, it's, is everybody's impression that they're chasing the the quarterly share price meaning meaning that program you know you're thinking about that when you're hiring writers when you're when you're green lighting a show you're like you know how how good is this show going to be is it going to be good enough you know to to sustain whatever our our stock is or increase it i mean it's it's that's what it is every in every industry now it would seem i am not smart enough to be a businessman at that level yeah. but i do see you know you see with the mergers the corporations are intent on it's starting to feel almost like a pump and dump situation. You know, they're, they're intent on <laughs> yeah. maximizing these quarterly profits. And then it's like, to what end are you building this business for an actual future? Or is it just sort of this short term three, four, five years? And then someone parachutes out and leaves behind whatever the hell happened there. You know, um, it, it's, it's hard to argue that they're not, there's not some short term thinking going on. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you certainly have seen that in like, the finance industry or like oil and gas, like they know everything's coming down, but let me make as much as I can before it does. And who cares? Like that's, that, that, that's a pretty bad way to run a company. But uh, anyway, let me ask you before I let you go. And I'd love talking to you. And, and it's such a, an important issue, the strike and everybody should be paying attention to that. Uh, what, you know, what, what would you say to people listening about, you know, why writers 
and their work is so important to the general public. Like, what does it mean for the rest, for the people who love these shows that you've worked on if there's a writer's strike? Well, more reality TV. Is that going to be one thing for sure? It's hard to tell. Is it, streaming makes it all very murky because there are options, you know, I mean, there's libraries, there's more stuff that's just sort of available. But the bottom line is every, uh, you know, everybody in show business, the crews, the actors, they've all gotten more and more screwed as things have gone on. And I want everybody to be making more money. You know, I want the crew, uh, like it's, it's, it's unfortunate that we can't sit down and talk about this like adults. I hope that's what's happening right now. I want to be very clear. You know, we're, we're taping this two days before we find out if there's going to be a strike or right. three days or whatever. Right. Right. It's always darkest before the dawn. It seems in 2017, we look, we, we were told the next day we're going on strike and we woke up the next morning. And they're like, hold on. We think we, I think we have something. And they made a very historic deal that basically preserved our pension and health uh, plan for, uh, you know, uh, many, many years in the future. It was a big deal. So I think and hope, and I'm not, it's not just like, you know, um, this is, there's real hope that the fact that we're at such loggerheads is actually good because they know we mean business and now they're hammering everything out and we're going to get to Tuesday and we will have made a deal and they will have listened to us and everything will be great. Um, and so if there is a strike, it's unfortunate that we have to go that route because it, you know, when business stops, it hurts more people, you know, in the short run in order to yeah. get gains for the long run. And I just want to say, I hope that those gains can be paralleled by other unions, including, you know, IATSE and SAG and everybody else. Um, because the business has changed so much and people need to, it needs to be corrected for yeah. all the people who work in it. Really well said, Mike. Um, lightning round real quick and I'll let you go. Uh, <laughs> you've been around all of the funniest people of our generation, your generation, whatever we're in. Tell me just, I know you're going to, it's a dumb question because you could say, tell me hundreds of different people, obviously Ray Romano, who, who is somebody that really consistently you love being around because they, they made you laugh a lot. Who's somebody, who are the funniest people that made you genuinely laugh? I mean, you know, there's so many, I mean, Ray, obviously, yes. Yeah. Uh, there's so many writers, you know, so I'm, I'm going to sort of go away, you know, Gloria Calderon Kellett, Kevin Beagle. These are people that I've either created shows with or co-run shows with. Um, you know, I, John Lovett on, uh, on 1600 pen who, you know, is podcaster extraordinaire now, uh, John Lovett, uh, you know, Jason Weiner, Josh Gad, um, you know, these are all people who like, we had such a good time. I mean, you know, Gory and I, Kevin and I, we still text talk pretty much every day because we just, it's such a delight to work with someone who like, they make you laugh, you make them laugh. Um, yeah, I guess it's part of the reason why I don't miss stand up because I'm like, eh, this person's laughing. <laughs> this person is laughing at my shit. I just need this audience of one person who I also respect ah. uh, greatly. And, you know, who I find talented yes. and funny as well. Yes. So, yeah, that's the greatest thing about this business is you work with... I've developed so much over the last three years with all these amazing writers. And I wish more of that stuff had sold. But the experience of, of developing the material with them, um, especially now that I'm old and I get to... You know, I work with younger writers. I'm like, yeah, oh, man, you're so talented. Uh, it's just great. It's like, that's the, that's the job is you laugh every day. Even if you're working on a drama, you can find a lot of places to laugh. So you just have such a good time creating things. It's, it's fantastic. Uh, how old are your kids? What would you say to my daughter and your kids when they're entering the world college, the workforce? I mean, how, how much advice can you, can you give to someone who's going to the, the school that you went to or maybe entering the industry that you are, are in? Well, my daughter's 24 and she's an illustration major from RISD and she's trying to get into animation. So I can, whatever advice I have hasn't worked yet because she's still knocking on the door because it's hard. It's hard. Animation actually sort of when she was graduating was, was like blowing up and now they're like cutting back, uh, over the last couple of years. But, but she's, you know, it's like any job in show business. It's just so hard. Uh, my son is 20 and he goes to Williams. 
although he's doing his junior year at Oxford. I have to say that uh, by law um, because it's true. (laughs) Um, So, so, but he's not, he's, uh, he's uh, majoring in political economy. So he's, I think, looking maybe to be a journalist or something like that. A little too early to tell. Um, But the thing about you need talent and you need to work your ass off and you need the opportunity. And the thing I try to say to everybody is, you could be the most talented and the hardest working. If you don't get the opportunity, none of it matters. There are people who have gotten an opportunity to work on something and, 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 had a, and ter- went into careers that were very long running, not because they were the hardest working person and not because they were the most talented person. They have to have, you have to have some of each of those things, preferably have the most, <laughs> you know, you, you be very talented, be yeah. very hardworking, yeah. but you have to create those opportunities and that's, and, and don't feel bad if you're not getting an opportunity. Uh, I, I mean, I mean, don't feel bad about yourself is right. what I'm saying. You know, you have to be patient. You have to keep, you know, do everything you can to get them, but the business is unfair and, you know, it, it's, it does not mean that you are a bad or untalented or unhardworking person. If somehow it's not all coming right. together at this moment for you, you the know? business like life keep trying, keep trying is unfair. Okay. And the final question, if you haven't noticed yet, the lightning round is no different than the rest of the interview. Uh, but <laughs> yeah, I, I'm taking my time with these fucking questions. <laughs> it's this, I think you're the perfect person to ask this. And the one thing I wanted to make sure, and I, I wasn't really worried about this cause I know you well enough, but like, I didn't ever want to in any way, like disrespect you during my conversation. You're such an a, established guy. You've had, all the success one can have in entertainment and television and writing and in comedy, you've done it all. And so the question is about ego. If someone does like slight you, uh, disrespect you, um, how do you handle that? Because I think that's, a, I, I, I ask this question a lot to men, especially to successful men, but even though, even if you're not quote successful, however that's defined, it's really hard when people are jerks and disrespectful to you, especially if you've done a lot and it's real easy for a guy like me to burn somebody down verbally. That's for sure. And <laughs> and I have done that way too often in my life. But I feel like you haven't. I feel like you could be stepped to uh, have your toes stepped on or be disrespected and realize it's not about you or whatever you do. How does Mike Royce deal with ego? I wish I was the person that you're describing. Hmm. Uh, I can be wounded very quickly and easily. And I, you know, you, you, from a business perspective, have to learn to deal with it. But it's amazing how much you can talk yourself into. I don't give a shit what people think. I'm just, I'm very secure in my creativity. I know what I'm doing. I'm good. If they don't think I'm good, that's just why just rolls right off my back. And man, it just, it's never, ever going to be true. <laughs> <laughs> never, ever going to be true. And the only thing you can do is just, you know, you do develop scar tissue. That's all there is to it. I, I definitely now, 20, 25 years later in writing, when a sh- show doesn't get sold, I don't, my heart heals faster. Mm. You know, I still invest emotionally in everything. But when there's a rejection, you know, it sucks. But I I can move on quicker. I, I now have at least learned the lesson that there's other things. You can move on to other things. And that sort of helps heal the rejection. So that's the answer to how it makes you feel. But I, my sense is that your reactions aren't necessarily like quick and negative in, in moments where people disrespect you, whether it be, you know, road rage in LA, someone cuts you off or you have a fight, you know, with, with someone you care about or work with, like, do you, do you, when are you are, when, you know, it's one way to, it's one thing to feel that way, but it's an, it's a worse thing to react poorly to slights and to insults. Uh, so I'm going to, this goes out to any executives who are watching this, who will do it, argue with you <laughs> about your characterization of my reactions. I have learned over the years and I continue to learn, especially when getting notes, you know, to take a beat and maybe express that I don't see it that way, but always take it back, get out of the room, go think about it. Because as you know, in my career at first, I was not so forbearing. I'm a very, a very nice guy and I can be a dick sometimes. And I know that, you know, and I try, I've learned to not be, not be a dick more and more um, because being a dick is like, just don't react so quickly, you know, don't react. 
And I'm not always successful. I'm mostly successful. I'm just not always successful. Um, You have to understand there are people doing jobs where sometimes they're giving notes, carrying water for other people. They're giving a note that maybe they they don't believe in, or they're just expressing themselves in a way that maybe isn't the, the, doesn't have a solution to whatever the problem that that they're uh, finding in the script, but that doesn't mean it's not helpful, you know, or at least that it shouldn't be considered. And so let me take this opportunity to apologize to anybody who I, I, well, I, I bet you, I bet you, if you were, and though. I think I'm better than a lot of people, <laughs> but I'm not immune to reacting quickly. Yeah. I bet you, if you were though, you were in defense of, of an idea or a person or a thing you really cared about. Sure. I, I can yeah. safely say that I rarely have been like, I'm just like, you know, it's, it's all I, when something's a, about a creative vision that I see, I get very passionate about it. And the key is to not, then go over into being, you know, yeah. I yeah. guess whatever uh, you losing your temper or something like that, yeah. which I don't, I don't lose my temper. You know, I have, but it's a extremely rare. Well, I hope there's tape of that somewhere. I don't, you know, that's a good question. No one like, will believe it. Like that's not Mike. Rice. <laughs> uh, Mike, I am so grateful to you for spending this long talking to me. I uh, just, you know, like I said, I've always admired you. I've always watched you. You've always been real nice guy. That's your reputation. And I'm uh, congratulations on just an unbelievably brilliant, amazing career. Thank you for talking to me. I appreciate everything you're saying. Thank you very much. And thanks for having me. Ah, uh, how about it? Mike Royce. What'd you think, everybody? Go follow him on Twitter at Mike Royce. A first timer here on the show. As always, let me know who you want to hear. Yesterday, I had a request for old Bruce Bartlett. I get a lot of requests for Bruce Bartlett and David K. Johnston to talk debt and debt ceiling. Also, that's from uh, Matthew Rotz emailed me that. And uh, the Sandman also emailed me and said, I got to get someone on to talk modern monetary theory. So thank you for both those suggestions. And I really appreciate it. Keep them coming. All right, that's all I've got for you today, other than the quote of the day, which I forgot yesterday. I am so sorry about that. Who was it that reminded me that I forgot it? I like this one from a guy named Benjamin Mays, who said, The tragedy in life doesn't lie in not reaching your goal. The tragedy lies in having no goal to reach. Oh, thanks, Benjamin Mays. I'm going to go set some new goals. Talk to you tomorrow. John Carroll, take us away. On your fence, even if it ain't a very friendly audience, well, they'll begin to listen when you start making sense and you stand up, stand up. No need to point your rifle to defend your town, just stand up, stand up. You know they can't deny you what you're laying down, boy, oh, you better stand up, stand up. Show your face of every color, yellow, black, red, and brown. Where every lost child will finally be found There's only one thing to do before we stand our ground And that's stand up, stand up Well, the founding fathers saw a land for all They had to stand up, they had to stand up They had a keen imagination for a crystal ball Drawing all the plans of a stand up But all they had to go on was the time they were in with other causes for laws And since they weren't even sent They knew that change was gonna come Before the change could begin They had to stand up All right, they had to stand up We got to stand up We got to look the devil square in the eye We got to let him know It's his time to go To make it clear when all we hear is a lie See him flee the scene of that experiment If you stand up All right, we got to speak up We got to reach up And raise your voice in every way you know how Don't be toes up 
You got to show up. Ain't no better time to do it but now. No need to pledge allegiance to no one's and try rise up. Show obedience to the voice inside. And listen well and hear. 